Good morning. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Nathan Allen Davis. He is a playwright from Rockford, Illinois, now residing in New York City. Um, his plays include The Refugee Plays, which is premiering at the McCarter Theater in 2020, Nat Turner in Jerusalem, the New York Theater Workshop, Dontrell Who Kissed the Sea, NNPN Rolling World Premiere, and The Wind in the Breeze Signet Theater. He received a Whiting Award in Drama in 2018. Other awards include the Steinberg ATCA New Play Citation, Stavis Playwright Award, Blue Ink Award, and Lorraine Hansberry Award. Mr. Davis is a lecturer in theater at Princeton University. Uh, please put away your cell phones and hold your questions until the end of his lecture. Thank you very much. Mr. Davis. Hello. Good morning. Thank you for being patient with me while I went the wrong way on a roundabout. <laughs> it's a lot of roundabouts here. First off, I wanted to begin by acknowledging that we are gathered here in the ancestral homeland of the Menominee, the Sioux, the Ho-Chunk, and near the lands of the Ojibwe, the Anishinaabe, and that we honor their stewardship of the lands and the waters in the past and the present. And my warm greetings to any indigenous peoples who are here today or watching on this feed. And I want to thank the theater department here at UW Oshkosh, um, Jane, Merlane, all the students, um, not only for doing the play, uh, Nat Turner in Jerusalem, but also just for inviting me here um, to be here with you. This is one of my favorite things uh, to be able to talk to folks about theater, to be in a room with people doing theater, uh, to try to connect with uh, students, uh, artists, people who are on a path of discovery about their own artistic journey. And whenever I'm able to travel to talk about theater and plays, I feel like I'm reminded of why uh, I do this. Uh, so thank you for being part of that for me. Um, I want to cover quite a bit today. I'm going to talk about Nat Turner in Jerusalem, which I hope you see the play. If you haven't, uh, the students are doing a wonderful job. Uh, the production's incredible. Uh, so I'll talk about the process of making that play. Uh, but I'm also going to want to open up uh, relatively early for questions because really I want this conversation to be as much about you as about me. I know it's a little bit different in a lecture type of format. Uh, I'll certainly have a lot to say and I tend to go on sometimes and I get on a tangent, but uh, I actually, I really want to meet you where you're at and I want this conversation to be about uh, your journey as much as, as mine. So. Please keep that in mind uh, when we get to the questions. I think one of the things I wanted to mention up top is that the making of art is a necessarily mysterious process. And so even the presumption that I could have something clear and articulate to say about it might be inaccurate. Not because I don't believe in what I'm doing or, or think I quote unquote know what I'm doing, but because I think not knowing can be just as useful as knowing when it comes to creating art and when it comes to putting yourself into a, a writing process. And for myself, one of the ways that I know I'm onto something when it comes to writing a play is when there are questions that I can't answer. When I feel haunted by something, when I feel curious about something, when I feel compelled by something, and I don't know exactly how to think of it or what to think of it, or what I should say about it, but I feel a need to engage with it. And that certainly is something that happened in the process of making Nat Turner in Jerusalem. One point of context that might be useful for you as I talk about the story of Nat Turner 
is, uh, is my religious background. I'm a member of the Baha'i faith. And the Baha'i faith is an independent worldwide religion which is founded by Baha'u'llah, whose name means the glory of God. It was founded in Persia, now Iran, in 1844. And the forerunner of Baha'u'llah is named the Bab, or the Gate, who also lived in Persia in the 1800s. And actually, this year marks the 200th anniversary of the birth of the Bab. He was born in 1819, and he was put to death by a firing squad in 1850. And the essential teachings of the Bab and then later Baha'u'llah uh, are about the unity of the human race. And without getting into an entire lecture about the religion, Baha'u'llah claimed to be the promised one of all religions and to be ushering in an era of universal peace, which would be marked by justice, by racial unity, by the equality of women and men, and by the unfolding of an ever-advancing civilization. So that was sort of my religious upbringing and background in this religion that I continue to practice today. Uh, as Merlaine mentioned, I grew up in Rockford, Illinois. I am the child of a, a interracial marriage. So my father is black, my mother is white. And I grew up with an identity as somebody who uh, is part of this story of uh, the coming unity of the human race and having to deal with my own uh, feelings about what it meant to be a mixed race, what it meant to be black, what it meant to have a white mother but not be considered white per se. All of these things are part of my, my upbringing, my background. But actually when it comes to the story of Nat Turner, I didn't know much about him at all until a few years ago. I don't recall learning anything about Nat Turner in elementary school or in high school, middle school. Even in college, I somehow missed that uh, part of history. I certainly knew who Nat Turner was. I knew that he had led a rebellion of enslaved people against the people who claimed to be their masters. That was about it. I didn't even know he was from Virginia until I started to look into it. So a few years ago, I was thinking, Nat Turner. Why do I know about Nat Turner? And I Googled Nat Turner. And what came up was the document, The Confessions of Nat Turner by T.R. Gray, which is an official court document that contains Nat Turner's confession of his rebellion uh, called Insurrection um, by, by Gray that um, was published in 1831 and it explains what he did according to Nat Turner through T.R. Gray. Um, the facts of, of the rebellion are that we know that Nat Turner led an uprising of enslaved people and that they killed somewhere around 50 white people, many of which were women and children. Probably as many blacks were killed as well in the aftermath, and even more in the aftermath after that, when it came to retribution and all these things. Uh, and it was something that really shook the consciousness of not only Southampton County, which is where Nat Turner was, but Virginia and the nation as a whole. It was something that um, was certainly the talk of the day and continues to reverberate now. And one of the things that I should probably mention is that you know, I'm not a historian by any means. And when, when you're in writing about history, I believe you certainly have an obligation to learn about what, as much as you can about what you're writing about. However, you are also an artist. You have to meet the history with your heart and not only with your mind. And so uh, for me, the, the thing that, that drew me about the story of Nat Turner's rebellion was 
that it surprised me the the way that it was described and there are quite a lot of factors to consider in terms of the confession there are some some who believe uh rightly so that we have to look at the confession with a, a definite grain of salt so to speak because uh tr gray uh as a white man living in virginia in the 1800s hundreds had a certain view of um, what the racial um, caste system was and was supposed to be. That was the system they were living under, system of slavery. And he certainly had his own prejudices and beliefs that would have affected the way that he told that story. Um, but what's interesting to me about the confession itself, or the document itself, I should say, is that one, Thomas Gray does make an effort to distinguish his own opinions from what he believes are the facts. Um, he cross-examines Nat Turner based on the evidence that he has available about what happened and believes that Nat Turner is telling the truth about those things. He says in the document that he is giving his words with little or no um, alteration. Uh, and there are times in the confession where he actually speaks highly of Nat Turner and not only negatively. There's certainly an, an overall negative characterization of Nat Turner in the document that's inarguable, that's definitely there. But it also seemed very clear that he was affected by Nat Turner. And while having no need or motivation to say anything positive about him, he still does. He, he talks about the fact that Nat Turner was among the most intelligent people he had ever met. Um, he talks about his charisma. And so he also even um, defends Nat Turner against certain um, claims made against him. For example, some people said that Nat Turner simply wanted to steal um, and that he was, uh, wanted, he was drunk and crazy. And so that was the reason that he did this uprising so he could take money and, and get drunk. And uh, Thomas Gray makes an effort to say that he's never heard of Nat Turner ever having a drink in his life, um, those types of things. So he's trying to set the record straight in the sense that he can from his perspective. Um, but, and that's not to absolve him of the other negative things he says about Nat Turner, that he was a fanatic, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, but it became very clear to me that there was some kind of effect that happened in, in this meeting between Nat Turner and Thomas Gray. They, they were in, a, court, they were in a, a prison cell in Jerusalem, Virginia. Uh, that city is no longer called Jerusalem. It's now called Cortland, Virginia. They've changed the name. Um, and through a series of interviews, he came up with this confession. Uh, but the thing that really surprised me when it came to Nat Turner himself, as characterized by Gray, is that I was more or less expecting to see the motivations for the, for the uprising being something to the effect of, I was a slave, I didn't want to be a slave, therefore I rebelled. That would make sense to me. Um, but that's not at all what is in the confession. In the confession, Nat Turner begins, and I'll, I'll just quote directly from it, the confession says, begins with Nat Turner saying, Sir, you have asked me to give a history of the motives which induced me to undertake the late insurrection, as you call it. To do so, I must go back to the days of my infancy and before I was born. So right away, he's saying, this didn't start, you know, um, yesterday, this didn't start a few days ago or a few years ago, this started before I was born. And he goes on to talk about the fact that his parents and his grandmother believed from his infancy that he was meant for great things, that he was a prophet. Uh, it talked about the fact that he had seen things um, and described things that happened before his birth without knowing them. And so that had a great deal to do with how Nat Turner saw himself. Uh, he also talks about learning to read almost without effort at an early age. 
And because of all these things, he was looked at um, in his community as being a prophet, as being somebody of great potential or great understanding. And he was even a preacher in his younger years, an actual preacher. And he, he did actually read, he had a Bible, his own Bible, which is now on display at the Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, D.C. Uh, and so right away, my understanding of Nat Turner's story was reframed. This isn't simply about a rebellion. <coughs> Excuse me. It's about more of a vision. And so uh, this sort of intersected with, again, my own understanding of what was happening religiously and spiritually at the time. As I mentioned, the Baha'i religion that I belong to began in 1844. And in the 1800s, there were many uh, new sects and new religions, <coughs> new offshoots of religions that were beginning um, around that time. It was a, a time of great messianic expectation, both in the East and in the West. So in the Christian and the Muslim worlds in the 19th, in the 19th century, there was this expectation of the coming of a new day, of the judgment day. This was all going on. And the Baha'i faith was a part of, of that. The birth of the, ba the Baha'i faith was a part of that. And so when I encountered Nat Turner talking about these signs he had seen in the heavens and how when he saw blood on the leaves, he believed he was being called to action. When he saw an eclipse of the sun, he believed that it was an it was a, um, a sign from God he was supposed to do something. This is why he took up arms against his oppressors. And what, what, I've simply, what I did was I simply took Nat Turner, Nat Turner at his word. Uh, it wasn't hard for me, given my background, to think, OK, there is some great spiritual upheaval, upheaval happening in the world right now. And Nat Turner is tapping into that. And so. Um, when I read the document, I was primarily thinking about uh, that, that part of the drama, so to speak. And so the play, um, when it came out, as the, as the play came out or developed or as I wrote it, it really became essentially a drama about an understanding of spiritual forces. And in the play, as I constructed it, it takes place the night before Nat Turner's execution. So once he's captured, um, he's brought to the capital of, um, which, of the county, which is in, in Jerusalem. And he's questioned, and then he's put to death. But before that, um, he's interviewed. <coughs> and so I imagined. Um, the possibility of a final meeting between Thomas Gray and Nat Turner the night before the execution. And this is where, of course, again, art departs from history. Uh, Nat Turner and Thomas Gray did actually meet privately, as happens in the play, but they didn't actually meet the night before Nat Turner was put to death. That was something that, a situation that I fabricated for the sake of, of the drama. Um, however, when we were doing the research, for the play, and I say we, I mean me and the director and the team at New York Theater Workshop who was doing the first production, um, we, we really relied heavily on the historical the facts and the scholarship available uh, because it felt like the right thing to do in terms of looking at what actually happened, not simply what we would have liked to have happened. Again, the premise of the play is fabricated, but a lot of the details that I was able to lean on dramatically uh, were not. And actually, as you know, the old saying is truth is stranger than fiction. It, it really is in, in many ways. Uh, one of the stories that illustrates that is that early on in the process of the play, um, I had written something to the effect that Thomas Gray uh, is a a non-believer, an atheist. Because uh, Nat Turner is making all of these, these sort of religious um, observations and making an appeal to Thomas Gray based on religion and based on belief and faith, assuming that Thomas Gray has that same belief. And spoiler alert, um, Thomas Gray doesn't share that belief. 
um, he in fact is an atheist and doesn't see the uh, religious justification um, for actions as valid, particularly when it comes to violence. Uh, I had some, when I, when I wrote that part of, the, uh, part of the dialogue and when it became clear that was the direction the character was moving in, I actually had some, instinctively it felt right, and it was certainly good for dramatic purposes, but I was, I was also like, really? Like, is that actually true? Because, you know, you're thinking of Virginia, you're thinking 1830s. You're not thinking that people call themselves um, atheists, so to speak, or, or talk about not believing in God. <coughs> that wasn't my, my general impression, thinking about the time with little information that I had. And some of the people at the theater also brought that up, saying, um, are you sure about this? Because this is Virginia in the 1830s, and it doesn't seem like that would be a thing. And I was like, yeah, OK, maybe not. I don't know. So then over the course of our research, we actually discovered that, and there's a lot more written about Thomas Gray than Nat Turner, for obvious reasons, I would think. And Thomas Gray was actually talked about as being an embarrassment to his friends because he t talked against God, so to speak. It actually was in the history. And then what's more, there was an account written that on his deathbed, and he died not long after Nat Turner actually, he became ill. He had a very tragic life because his wife died, his child died young. But Thomas Gray also died, I believe around five years or so after the insurrection. And apparently on his deathbed, he was quoting Bible verses and talking about revelations and this kind of thing. And so it seemed to me that a confirmation of the instinct I had about Thomas Gray being affected by this private audience he had with Nat Turner. Again, that's not me saying factually this is exactly what happened. I'm not claiming to know, and I'm not claiming to um, <clears throat> have an authoritative uh, viewpoint. Um, but based on the evidence that's there, it certainly supports the possibility of it. And again, theater is really about possibilities, and it's about imagination, and it's about the sense we make of history um, now, <clears throat> and it's understanding uh, how the understanding of history now um, uh, relates to our present world. And so that was a very, um, that was a moment, uh, again, where the history and the um, imagination collided in a way I didn't expect. Uh, and oftentimes, when we don't really look at history, we don't know how strange it is. Um, I find that the more I actually read real accounts, real historical accounts, letters, um, you know, people's recollections of things that they, they, they witnessed, they're fascinating, and they're dramatic, and they're weird, and oftentimes we assume that history has to be this cut and dry, distant thing. Another thing that um, was uh, an interesting part of the development process of the play as I mentioned that it really is, in essence, a drama about perspectives and about belief and about faith and all these things. And those aren't really typical things to dramatize or easy things to dramatize, especially in theater that we typically see nowadays. <clears throat> Certainly, people having faith as part of their background is a thing that we see all, all, all the time uh, in dramatic characters, but having a a play that centers around faith essentially um, can be a challenge. And there was a change that, that was made during the process that was key, and one that I wrestled with quite a bit, and frankly, I still do. But originally, when I wrote the first draft of the play, Nat Turner was actually quite ecstatic and happy to be a martyr. And there are some parts of the Confessions of Nat Turner that indicate that he was, in fact, 
he did he did consider himself a martyr. Um, and my understanding of religious martyrdom, again, according to my own faith background, is that there is an ecstasy about giving yourself up for a cause. And there's a sense of when you give yourself to a higher purpose, it's actually one of the most complete uh, holistic uh, things you can do when you throw yourself into uh, a belief that you're willing to die for. And so my initial take on the character was that Nat Turner was happy the day before his death, that he was looking forward to finally meeting his maker, so to speak, and that he was ready to go. And there was a certain part of that that certainly rang true for me, and I think even for the actor uh, that was playing Nat Turner in the original production, and a lot of it felt cool and poetic and great, but there was also kind of a problem when it came to how to make that a sustainable thing for an entire evening of theater. Because typically, theater deals with conflict, right? Theater deals with how we struggle. And even if the play isn't necessarily about revealing secrets that weren't, un that weren't known, and now we're fighting about it, and now we're yelling over dinner and throwing food, it, all plays don't do that. But there does have to be some type of conflict uh, that the characters are struggling with. And so I was struggling to find, well, what is Nat Turner's conflict? He's happy to die. He's going to die tomorrow. Sounds good, you know? Not a whole lot, to, 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 not a whole lot uh, of room to move from there. So that was a problem. And over the course of the development process, and then when we got into rehearsals for the play, uh, through conversations with Megan sandberg Zakian, who's my director, and, and through um, conversations with some of the cast and dramaturgs and people, one of the things that, that came up was the idea that people of faith also experience immense doubt. That having faith doesn't mean that you never doubt it. And in fact, having faith sometimes means you experience intense, intense doubt. And so I asked myself, well, what if Nat Turner and the night before his execution was experiencing doubt? Because that would be, of all things, the worst possible thing for Nat Turner to face. Uh, one sort of rule of thumb, if you're writing a play, tends to be to at least as a thought experiment explore what's the worst possible thing that could happen to your character. Right? And you could go very literal with it and say, well, if the character died or got tortured, that would be bad. Yes, true. But specifically for your character, what's the worst possible thing that could happen to them in this moment? And for Nat Turner, he knows he's going to die. He's expecting to die. And so the worst thing that could happen is if it was all for nothing. Right? The worst thing that could happen is if he actually didn't believe in the thing that made him arise up in the first place. And so <clears throat> that caused me to change direction a little bit, well, not a little bit, a lot, but it changed the beginning of the play uh, to where Nat Turner is beginning by a, a, experiencing this moment of, of doubt and appealing to God for some kind of sign that he's not totally wrong. And then when Thomas Gray comes into the picture, uh, Nat Turner sort of uses Thomas Gray as a way to exercise his faith and a way to make himself, again, believe in, in his cause. And it also gives Nat Turner somebody to sort of work on, right? If you're alone by yourself, there's not a whole lot you can do. But now there's a person and maybe there's a way that he can continue to prove his faith and to act as this instrument of God that he believes he is. So that was very helpful. Um, experiencing uh, <clears throat> for myself my own doubt about if the play is going to work, and then finding a way to, even if the play is a quieter, more mellow type of play than you might expect for a play about rebellion and insurrection, it's still a play that wrestles with a very essential conflict. And that felt important to do.
One of the interesting things that came up in the process of putting the play on was that I believe opening night of the play was the same night as the first presidential debate between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. And I remember getting a, a phone call from a reporter for a major news publication, publication. And they asked me what it meant to me to have that happening, to have the play happening at the same time as this moment was happening in our country. And as we know, like, you know, the thought of our country experienced a huge shift um, with that presidential election. And the play actually happened before the election happened, or the, the first production did. But already there was this sort of intensity, right, about what was going on. And they were asking me to, to comment on that. And I really couldn't come up with a good quote for them. I had a hard time. And what I ended up saying, I don't remember what I actually said, because I probably just blabbed for a while and then was like, Ugh. But the essential point I was trying to make, which I think I did, did make, was that you know, this conversation the play is having is actually not a political conversation in the same way that we think of politics. And that's not to say that politics is unimportant or that political conversations are not important or that we should ignore what's happening in the world at all. But that it occurred to me that this play is an invitation to look at division in this country, and for that matter in the world, in a different framework. It, it wasn't really, to me, to put it into the context of, okay, well, how does it relate to the debates, was actually, and this might feel like hubris, was actually cheapening the play in a certain way. Um, most works of art, and I say this to you as fellow artists, you know, you have your, your inclinations, the things you want to say, the things you believe, your visions for what you want to make, and you, you have an opportunity to create a world in which those things manifest themselves and for people to experience them, right? And oftentimes, uh, as, our, as artists, we are asked to take that work and to put it into a context that it was not made for and to put it up against something, some other type of of, of debate or conflict. Now, there are, are some people who are inspired by politics and want to write about them, and that's also an okay endeavor to do, if that's what you feel moved to do. That's totally fine. But I knew that this was not where this, what this play was born from. And so it was hard for me to not give a good quote, but I also felt like, well, this is the truth as I, as I see it for, for this work. And then they didn't actually run the story at all, right? because it wasn't really a good story um, for, that, for, for that medium. And I think what that leads me to, and with this, I think we'll open it up to, to questions, is, is a, a question about like what, what is the purpose of creating theater, of creating a work of art? What is the purpose of putting a dramatic story on stage for people to experience in real time. I think for myself, I look at it as an opportunity to create a conversation that might not otherwise happen, as an opportunity to disappear into a, a world that you otherwise would not have had access to. And hopefully through that experience, you have had your mind and your heart open to something that you may have not previously been. But I'm interested in what, in what you think about that and what questions and comments and thoughts you have about your own journeys with your own art making. So with that, thank you for listening. I'd like to open it up to questions. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks. Uh, what was it about Nat Turner that inspired you?
you as opposed to other abolitionist leaders of the time, such as like Frederick, Del Frederick Douglass or you know, people like that? The question was, what was it about Nat Turner that inspired me as opposed to other abolitionist leaders at the time, as opposed to uh, such as Frederick Douglass, other folks like that? I think primarily it was the confession document. It was the heightened language of it. That was also part of just the writing of the time. Things were written in a sort of heightened flowerly language. But there seemed to me to be some kind of power behind the words, which I took again as a, an indication there was some kind of significant interaction between, between Nat Turner and Thomas Gray. And again, uh, Nat Turner certainly could be and should be considered an abolitionist because the purpose of his uprising was to uh, free himself and his community from slavery. But he didn't publish abolitionist papers. He didn't talk about, uh, at least as far as we know, you know, uh, he didn't have the opportunity to do that, right? Uh, However, he was approaching it almost purely from this spiritual, mystical perspective, which I found fascinating. Because when we're talking about any issue, uh, whether it's an issue now or an issue of the past, and of course all those things are linked together, you know, racism hasn't gone away simply because slavery has, right? But what we get to is what is, what is the actual essence of the issue? For Nat Turner, he looked at it as a spiritual issue. He, his, his framework, his paradigm was, this is, what I'm, th this is what I'm seeing in the Bible, which was his holy book that he had access to, and this is what I'm seeing in the world, and they don't match. So I thought that was fascinating. Uh, up there and then down there. Um, what was the most difficult part about um, just kind of adapting a story from history into a play while telling a compelling story? The question was, what was the most difficult part of, wait, you gotta help me out, telling a story from history? Mm -hmm. uh, just kind of applying historical aspects to it while, uh, while continuing to tell a compelling story? Applying historical aspects while continuing to, com to tell a compelling story. Gotcha. Yeah, it's hard. The reason it's hard is because sometimes when you do a lot of research into something, you don't really want to write about it anymore. At least I, I sometimes have that happen. In this case, it, it helps because when I did the first draft of the play, and this rarely happens in theater, but I did the first draft of the play in March of 2016, and the theater committed to producing it like a couple of weeks later in the next fall. So I didn't have much time until the play was being produced, so I had no choice but to write it, and the fear of having it be terrible was a great motivator. <laughs> <laughs> and also the excitement, oh, this is my opportunity to share a story with the world, right? I mean, it's not only about the fear, but so that helped me in that instance. Uh, but it can be hard because when you're studying history and facts, again, who knows what they're going to lead, what, what path they're going to lead you on. And sometimes you feel responsible, and as you should, for, for imparting what you know. Right? I mean, once you learn about history and you know that other people don't know about this history, you think, well, if I'm representing the story, it's my job to make sure that people know after they see it, right? So there was, there's that burden, which isn't always helpful. I think in the production that we did at New York Theater Workshop, we ended up putting uh, a thing in the brochure in the program describing Nat Turner's rebellion, which I realized I did never tell you about, the actual rebellion of Nat Turner. Well, yeah, I told you a little bit. But we described the, basics, the basic facts of it as we knew them, uh, just to get that out of the way so people at least had that context when they were watching the play. But yeah, it's not an easy answer. It's not an easy question. To, I think it's mostly about 
finding for yourself a point of honesty where you know that you have a personal feeling about this story because no matter what you write, it's an expression of your interaction with the history that is gonna manifest on stage, right? And that's actually the reason people are there is to see how do you feel about it, you know? Not simply what happened. If, you, if they wanna know just what happened, there's books, you know, there's, there's scholarship, there are, there are means to, for people to, to find out the, the information, the historical information. And so they're at the theater because they wanna know how you feel about it and, and what your artistic uh, expression of those feelings is. Um, and then, uh, you can talk a little bit about your relationship with the New York Theater Workshop and um, what influence the director had on your work. The question was the infl my relationship with the New York Theater Workshop and the influence that the director had on the work. Great. Yes, that's a good question. So New York Theatre Workshop is the place where the show was originated. I was actually doing a fellowship there called the 2050 Fellowship at the time I wrote the script for Nat Turner. And I wrote the script there because I was not afraid to fail there. <laughs> because the whole way that the fellowship was set up was that you could work on something have a sort of gentle conversation with peers and with their, their staff about it. It was presented as being an opportunity to explore art in a very pure way, which is hard to do in New York because of the atmosphere is very, you know, it's, it's, it's intense. And there's, everything is looked, looked at um, differently because it's, it's, it's professional, it's, there's a lot of, crit there's, the critical aspect is always, is always present, it's very competitive, and this is a great thing, I mean it also brings out a lot of great work, but it's great to have also a space where you can kind of remind yourself, oh yeah, I, I'm an artist, I want to just explore being an artist here. So when I was at doing the fellowship, I had this concept for writing a play about Nat Turner, and I thought this play might not work at all. It might be terrible, it might not be a play. I'd never written a play about uh, historical events before. So th I thought this is a great place that I can try and fail if necessary, right? Um, of course, the irony is that they then produced it like very quickly. Uh, but I think I probably never would have written the script I had if I had been having that pressure from the, from the beginning. Uh, but my director for the world premiere was Megan sandberg Zakian, who I had worked with previously on a production of a different play. And Megan and I really see eye to eye in a lot of ways. And she was somebody that I knew I could just talk to about my process and what the concept was. And I had a conversation with her about the play before I even wrote the play, which I don't normally do with a lot of people. But for Megan, it made sense. I sent her a draft of the play that was actually like a pre-draft one, <laughs> and we had a conversation about it, and that draft ended up becoming sort of fertilizer for the future draft. Uh, and then she did the workshop, and then the theater brought her on to direct the production. And she was, ex I mean, her and I really were working in tandem in a lot of ways. Probably the, the thing that made me appreciate her collaboration the most was there was a point during previews. So uh, at a lot of off-Broadway theaters, the previews um, of the play in you know, a full production with audience cost a little bit less, and you're still in rehearsal, right? So you're still developing the play. And the previews were happening. I was doing a lot of rewrites, and a couple of things. One is that she told me, she told me like, you know, um, we have five rehearsals left, and we have five scenes in the play, so you gotta stop rewriting at some point. <laughs> like she would, she would made a lot of space for me to keep writing and wanted me to have as much space as possible, but she finally said, you know, this is actually your limit, so just know that. And I probably did my most productive writing that night after that conversation. And then there was a point in which I gave her some pages, and she called me, and she said, you know, I hate to tell you this, but 
I feel like this isn't, this writing is not you. It feels like notes. And I was really thankful for that because quite literally I had been thinking, mulling over some notes about a, a change and I was writing kind of reactively, right, in a very kind of reactionary way, trying to fix it. And the writing was bad. It just it wasn't, it wasn't the play. And she recognized that. Um, and so, and, you know, in those conversations, again, it was an ongoing collaboration. It's hard to, to parse out exactly what the effect was. Uh, I think her, she was the one who brought up to me uh, a lot of the, the, the conversation about, you know, the question of doubt and faith. Like that was a conversation that we had. So it was a, a very fruitful collaboration. Um, and uh, the New York Theater Workshop gave us the platform and the space to, to do it, you know, and just let it happen. That was really great. Follow-up question? I was just wondering, did you talk about the William Styron novel? Oh, the William Styron novel. Right, so there's a, a novel called The Confessions of Nat Turner by William Styron, which I believe won the Pulitzer Prize, right? Yes, I'm getting, I'm, I'm getting a yes. Um, yeah, I never read that novel. I mean, never really talked about it. Um, I, I knew it existed. And I, yeah, I didn't, um, I didn't feel at the time, I certainly, there might have been a time when it would have been useful for me to read it, or I would have been curious enough to read it. But in the process of making the play, I was like, this is not the time. <laughs> To, to have someone else's interpretation of Nat Turner in my head. Even there was the Nate Parker movie that came out that same year <clears throat> um, about Nat Turner. They also just didn't see it, didn't watch it. Um, I felt like it was important for me to approach the story on my own terms without having to, was, there was already the task of having to meet the story where it was and, and, and dealing with the history of it. And then to add that to being in conversation with somebody else's interpretation felt like it might make it hard for me to be productive. Yes? Um, are you currently working on something new, and what is the subject matter of your new work? <clears throat> the question was if I'm working on something new, and what is the subject matter? Uh, yes, I'm working on a few new plays. One of them is actually about Black Wall Street, which is a neighborhood of Tulsa, Oklahoma, called Greenwood that was destroyed in the race riot. And I'm currently re rewriting that project. It's uh, hard. I think in this, in this case, the research that I did was very compelling. And because there, there wasn't a production right in the horizon, more challenging in some ways. Uh, for me not to get stuck. So I'm working my way through that. And I'm working on a project called The Refuge Plays that's gonna happen at the McCarter Theater in 2020. And that's more of a family drama, comedy-ish epic. It's long, it's gonna be like five hours. But they, thankfully the theater is okay with that, which is, I don't take for granted at all. But that project's been in development for about four years, and um, I'm looking forward to that happening. I've done some television writing in the meantime, other things to sort of you know, pay the bills. So there's a lot going on. I'm very thankful to have a lot of projects happening, but I'm also feeling very spread thin, which can be the sort of, I guess, double-edged sword of taking on projects. And commissions, taking on commissions from theaters can also be wonderful, uh, but I think also important to be careful with how many you take and when you take them, if you're offered them, uh, because there's, there's pros and cons to entering into a, that kind of process. Yes? Are a lot of lines from the play taken directly from the confession? The question was, are a lot of lines of the play taken directly from the confession? Yeah, there are a few. And some that are not directly exactly the confession, but <clears throat> the essential thought is taken pretty directly. I'd highly recommend reading the confession, by the way. It's on, you know, it's part of the public record. You can download it from the internet. 
it's just called Confessions of Nat Turner by T.R. Gray. And, you know, it's a fascinating read. Up there, yes. Do you have the intention that the audience can potentially explain that away similarly? Okay. Yeah, so the question is, is it to validate the faith, Nat's faith, or is it the intention for the audience to be able to explain it away? That's a great question. I think, I hope, that it could be different depending on your perspective. Um, it's, I think they happen in a way that I believe you could make either interpretation that this really happened or this didn't happen. And I think that's really a lot of times where what, what we're led to when we're considering mystical phenomenon or, or religious phenomena or, exper or miracles. Um, you know, if, if you witness a miracle, if a miracle happens, it can be proof of your faith to your, to, for you if it happened to you, right? But it doesn't necessarily prove to somebody else that they, they didn't experience it. Or if they, if they did, they might have seen it in a different way. So I look at miracles in, in that way that, you know, uh, I've certainly seen and experienced miraculous things in my life. But I don't look at that as, because I experienced this, you have to believe it. You know, it's more, this, this, was a, this, is, this is how I interpret these events. And I think that hopefully the play opens the door for you to see it in whatever way is useful for you to see it. Um, yeah. Uh, up there and then down here. How often did you use your Bible when writing? How often did I use my Bible in writing? Not, not a ton, not a ton. I mean, I'm not Christian, you know? So uh, I, I, I've read the Bible and I, I, I don't, I'm not, I, um, I consider the Bible a holy text. Uh, and I certainly referred to some of the passages that Nat Turner refers to. But also there are some passages, there are some things that Nat Turner says that aren't in the Bible that he takes as his own revelation, you know what I'm saying? Or his own, his own interpretation of, of the Bible that he's, he, that he's then passing on. And so there were some moments where we had to look and say, hey, is this in the Bible? And we found, oh, it's not. This is him reading the Bible and then seeing this and then putting two and two together. And so it was interesting to, to kind of go on that journey. Down here? Uh, yes, yeah, so the question was, how do I feel about the play being some audience member's first, first exposure to Nat Turner? That's a good question. Oh, man. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I, 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 I don't, I, weirdly, I don't think about it a lot. You know? Uh, that's kind of cool that, that it might be for some people. That's actually great. Um, I think, I think more is like I I I wrote the story because of what the story meant to me, and sharing it. Um, and and yeah, like I don't I don't know you know how it might affect people's understanding of Nat Turner. Uh, hopefully, if anything, it would encourage people to want to know more. Um, but thanks for bringing that up. Yes. How many productions of it have you seen? Oh, the question was how many productions of Nat Turner have I seen? This is the third. So I saw the one at New York Theater Workshop. I saw one in DC at Forum Theater in 20, I guess that was 2018. We have a few more minutes if there's, if there's more questions. Yes. Okay, the question was, why did I choose to set up the script in a prose poetry format? By which you mean there are some parts that are, have kind of broken up first type of lines. Right. 
I don't know. <laughs> it's a really good question. It felt right. It felt right initially. I think that oftentimes I'm writing a play. I, the way that looks on the page aesthetically does matter to me, and I think it, it affects the way that uh, people who are going to do the play approach it. Oftentimes, if you break up lines, like I, I, I'm not, when you break up lines into, you know, like, <clears throat> when you essentially add verse lines to a text and you write it as poetry, the risk is that people will get really precious with it and overindulge in the poetry of it and to start saying things like they're beautiful words, uh, which did not, not happen in this production, by the way. Um, well done. Um, uh, but if, if you're reading it as an actor, usually you're able to find the reasons why they're broken up. It's often about the, the thought, right? It's about maybe there's not a pause at the end of the line because there's no punctuation, but it's broken up because there's sort of two thoughts that are a little bit separate. And usually the proof is in hearing it. So if I hear actors speaking it in a way that feels right and that they seem to be engaged and inspired and able to lend their own artistic voice to it while still getting the essential meaning and point across, I know that it's at least in the ballpark. And I will sometimes like switch, you know, using, you know, editing it and cutting and pasting and moving it around. But essentially that's, I'm not sure if that answers the question, but that's kind of the way that I approached it. Uh, the question was, does it mean anything to me to have the play performed in a predominantly white campus? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Yes, I don't know. I don't really know how to, th I, th I feel like the play, uh, I know that in the theater in general, uh, the so-called professional theater, theater that is primarily done through theater institutions that are sponsored by donors and by government, et cetera, tends to be relatively white in terms of the audience and in terms of donors. Uh, so that's not abnormal. And I think really, it, it brings up a lot of questions that we could have a whole other lecture on actually. But I think, I think ultimately, I wrote the play for people who, will, who want to listen. You know, I don't, I don't think that that um, I'm, I'm sure that an audience at an HSBCU, for example, would be, um, sorry, HS, HBCU would be a different audience than an audience here, certainly, right? I don't know exactly how that would change the play, um, but an audience is a part of, the, is a part of it. Um, and primarily, the play, I think, speaks to people who understand English. Right, and then how how they respond to it will certainly be filtered through their cultural understanding and their own history. But I can't I can't be in charge of that, you know. I think that's our time. Think that's our time. Thank you so much.